the first Sunday in Lent. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. In silence, let us recall our failures to love fully as individuals, as church, and as society. God forgives and heals us. We need your healing, merciful God. Give us true repentance. Some of sins are plain to us. Some escape us. Some we cannot face. Forgive us. Set us free to hear your word to us. Set us free to serve you. God forgives you. Forgive others. Forgive yourself. Through Christ, God has put away your sin. Approach your God in peace.
through St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for so by doing, some people have unknowingly given, given hospitality to angels. Through, angels through, through Jesus, therefore, let us continue to offer to God a sacrifice of praise and the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. <clears throat> For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. relatives. 
So how do we become beloved community? Dr. King said that, quote, at its core, the beloved community is an engine of reconciliation. And he also said it will require a qualitative change in our souls, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. I believe this is what Jesus was getting at in the passage from Luke's Gospel, the very familiar story of the so-called Good Samaritan. In it, a Pharisee, an expert in Jewish religious law, tries to test Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks. And Jesus asks him what the law says. And he responds with a beautiful summary of love God, love your neighbor. And Jesus replies, bingo, you got the right answer, do those. But the man presses on, and who is my neighbor? Because if you can decide who exactly your neighbor is, then you know who you need to treat well and who you can ignore. Jesus does not fall into that trap. He tells this familiar story, and he ends with the questions, which of these acted like a neighbor to the injured man? who acted like a neighbor. If we want to be part of a community in a world that embodies beloved community, where all people have a place to live, enough to eat, where all are treated with respect and dignity, we might think that this is mainly about solving problems or helping out those people over there. But if we pay attention to Jesus and Dr. King, it sounds like the starting place needs to be changing our souls, the way we think and how we act, how we need to be reconciled to others. Beloved community is about building genuine relationship, and it is actually very countercultural. It goes against the dominant culture that we've all been raised in. So in order to change, we need to know what those ideas and habits are that have shaped us. That means we need to understand this dominant culture, which is white culture. Now we've been trained to think that this is the only real culture, or not even to see it as a culture, just the way things are. White culture values and supports white people and devalues non-white people. But it also contains a lot of habits, a lot of values that we take for granted as good or the way things are and should be. White culture affects everybody in this country. Through laws and habits, it privileges people of white or light skin and puts barriers up for the rest. Now, all of us who are white directly and indirectly benefit from this culture. The Episcopal Church is also a place of overwhelming whiteness, of historical wealth and influence, of education and power. And this is the truth. In my embodied racism practice, every week we hear guidance for white-bodied participants, kind of a way to encourage us to keep struggling with this. And the first principle is, accept the awkward. Talking about white culture is new for many of us. And that means try to be open to what I'm saying and to what others are saying about white culture, even if it makes you uncomfortable. If you find yourself going, la, 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 I can't hear you, you might want to notice that and say, wow, I guess I am uncomfortable. But you don't need to judge yourself for it. Just notice it's a hard thing to wrestle with. We're not used to doing this. Understanding our whiteness is a process, and it is painful. It takes time. We also need to have some compassion about doing this work. It is also necessary if we are ever to aspire to becoming beloved community, 
because white culture affects not only race relations, but all relationships and all social justice issues in this country. Perhaps you have heard of the white supremacy culture characteristics by Tima Oken, a white woman who built on the work of Kenneth Jones and many others. She identified a number of ways white culture shows up in organizations. She says our institutions not only value these characteristics, they to some extent require them and constantly reproduce them in order to benefit from them. And we as individuals also internalize them. Now these white culture characteristics are particularly toxic to black, brown, and indigenous bodies, but they harm all of us. Some of these characteristics are, and it's a long list, so just bear with me. Some of these characteristics are fear, perfectionism, individualism, a sense of urgency, defensiveness and denial, worship of the written word, the belief in one right way, paternalism, binary thinking, power courting, fear of open conflict, and the right to comfort. Yeah, it's a lot, so I'm only going to explore one or two of these today. Let's consider binary thinking. Oaken says that binary thinking reduces the complexity of life and the nuance of our relationships with each other and all living things into either or, yes or no, right or wrong in ways that reinforce urgency, perfectionist thinking, and abuse of power. We have been conditioned to think in binary terms, if it's either this or that. And this is how we see other people, it's also how we make decisions often. And usually there is a judgment attached to these things. Like white is good or safe, and black is seen as bad or not safe. Male is good, and female as, well, not as good, not as strong or smart or something. Rich, good, poor, bad, heterosexual, good or normal, everybody else, deviant or strange. Native-born is good, immigrant is suspect. Now isn't that the way most of us grew up thinking? Or not even thinking, just kind of assuming and reacting, a knowing, because that's how we were taught. Now I hope a lot of us don't think in those terms these days, at least consciously, but even subconsciously, they're probably rolling around in there. Again, because that's how we were taught. And again, it's not putting, telling us that we're terrible people, but trying to be aware of these, this, this way of thinking. Well, let's see how this shows up in our story. In Jesus' time, there were very clear distinctions between Jews and non-Jews, between Jews and Samaritans, and between Jews and Gentiles. There were clear distinctions between Pharisees, those who studied the Torah or law, and Sadducees, those who served at the temple. There were distinctions between clean and unclean, between what was lawful and not. So the lawyer was asking Jesus, who is the person who is my neighbor and who is not? Because that probably would have meant something like other Jews and maybe foreigners in your land, those are your neighbor and everybody else not. Kind of binary thinking. Jesus tells the story to mess with our binary thinking. He says a man, a Jewish man, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. He was traveling a notoriously dangerous route. He was beaten and left naked and close to death. He would have had no identifying clothes on him to tell which group he belonged to. Two good 
religious people, a priest and a Levite, came upon him and kept going. Why didn't they stop? Well, they couldn't tell if he was Jewish or Gentile. They might have thought he was dead, which would have made them ritually unclean if they touched him. They might not have been sure what to do or how to care for him. How often we don't, if we don't want to do something wrong, so we do nothing at all. Now, Samaritans were generally despised and avoided by Jews. But here, again, Jesus kind of messing with our assumptions. Here, a Samaritan man came upon the hurt man, tended his wounds, transported to him to an inn, and left money for his care. Jesus is challenging the binary thinking of that time and of our own. So Jesus asked the lawyer, which of these three people, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was a neighbor to the hurt man? And the answer was not a matter of law. It was not a matter of which people were in your social circle. It wasn't a matter of status or power, about looking good or having the means to be a neighbor. The lawyer answers, the one who had mercy on him. The one the hearers would least expect to be the star of the story because they had been conditioned to think ill of Samaritans. So, good Samaritan is kind of an oxymoron. The Samaritan, however, responded by seeing the beaten man, having compassion, putting himself at risk and at expense to take care of him. Jesus says to the lawyer, go and do likewise. Doing the work of becoming beloved community means we really have to wrestle with these categories and allow them to be turned upside down, like Jesus did with the lawyer and with this story. We are coming to realize that gender is not just male or female, but a continuum. We're realizing there are many expressions of sexuality, not just a man and a woman loving each other. We're having to come to terms with our colonial history, which means that the real native-born people are not us, they are the ones whose lands we took. And we have to understand that much of our wealth comes from stealing land and labor from others. Now, this is not about blaming or shaming ourselves or others. These are about invitations to be coming into a place of more humility and opening up our worldview being able to understand life differently so that we can change and become beloved community. Paternalism, another characteristic of white culture, is also a kind of binary thinking. Paternalism is the idea that the power people have the knowledge to make decisions for others, generally the people without power, without even including or consulting them. It is the idea that we know what's right, and they don't. In church, we have historically been guilty of paternalism, seeing ourselves as good and righteous people who have the means to help out those unfortunate people, without actually developing relationships to them, listening to them, finding out what the roots of their problems are, acknowledging our own complicity in the problems of society, or standing alongside them to advocate for system change. Instead, we get to hold on to our privilege and feel good about the little bits that we do for others. Real, beloved community means we need a change of perspective. Justice and help and relationship are all two-way streets. The Jewish lawyer wanted to know who his neighbor was, and the story, and in the story, it was the Jewish man who was treated as a neighbor by the Samaritan. 
This church wants to start exploring who is here on Cape Ann and what some of the issues are affecting the communities. My hope is that as we do that, we have a stance of curiosity and humility. Humility. Not one of church's generally greatest assets. And I don't mean St. John's, I mean church in general. It's really important to understand that we are not free until all people are fed and whole and free. We need to understand that we are complicit in the systems that cause people to be oppressed and hungry and homeless. And our question, our attitude, should neither be, how can we help those poor people getting into paternalism, nor how can we find bodies and bucks to fill the pews and save our church? Not that either. But instead, this curiosity about who is here in the community, what is happening, what are the needs, but what are the gifts and possibilities? Where could the Holy Spirit be stirring up life and love? Where could we together build beloved community? We need the community as much as they need us. Maybe we need them even more. We need to listen and pray and listen and ponder building relationship and doing our reconciliation work. That is the start to doing beloved community. So let us pray. Gracious God, you call us to become beloved community. Something that we are neither going to do perfectly nor probably ever even see in our lifetime. But you call us to allow ourselves to be changed. You call us to go and be uncomfortable so that we can build genuine relationship with people in the community people who have much to teach us and to give us and to share what we have as well, together, building beloved community. Send your spirit upon this church. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes. We ask you to guide us in this work and empower us because without you, we cannot do it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
the church, the world, and ourselves as we strive to become a beloved community. We pray for Mother Earth and the indigenous people who have been her caretakers for millennia. May we respect their wisdom and reverence for all life, understand, like them, how interconnected all created beings are, and work for reparations to them and to our Mother. spirit of life. May we all undergo the qualitative change in our souls as well as the quantitative change in our lives that beloved community requires. Lord, in promises that God's community is among these.
right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. His cross has given us strength and freedom to enter by the narrow gate, to choose the path of life, and in these 40 days to share his trials. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with John and Mary and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all, of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God.
eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of the body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. God's blessing be with you, Christ's peace be with you, the Spirit's outpouring be with you, now and always. Amen. Amen.